Greetings! It is I, Countess Naraman Jacobin, your Lord and Emperor here at the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. You're joining me for some more Pathfinder lore, I'm introducing you to a new country or region on the planet of Galarian. Today we're going to be talking about Rasmiran. A very interesting country to talk about, to say the least. We'll get into it, though. But of course, if you're joining me live on Twitch, hey Twitch, that would be nice. Uh, at very least to support things, and I'm glad you're here live. The comments are going to be over on the side there. If you're joining me on YouTube later on, where most of you technically tend to join me, hey YouTube, also glad to have you here too, and enjoying this a couple days later, uh, having been recorded for your enjoyment too. Uh, remember on that channel, the, the like, ring the bell, um, subscribing, and the question of the day for both YouTube and which is, have you done any adventures, or done an adventure around Rasmir? Because there are a couple of adventures and stuff that do relate to Rasmirin. A few, uh, not many, but also you could have had an adventure there. There's a possibility of just visiting there as part of an adventure. That's the question for me. Let's dive into it. And where I like to start usually is giving some suggestions if you want to do some research on your own. Uh, more than just using online sources like on Archives of Nephis, uh the Pathfinder Wiki, or things like the oh the PSFRD D twenty one have any lore stuff there. Certainly might have some things that will relate to this. If you don't want to use those, there's a bunch of books to check out. And I can recommend a bunch of them. So let me do just that for you. Of course we will start with uh there we go. The campaign settings book. We got our early introduction to Rasmiran. There's also the Inner Sea World Guide. These are both first edition books that deal with Rasmiran, so we're dealing with original parts of it. And then, if you're looking for an adventure, there's the Year of the Open Road from the Pathfinder Society and Lodge of the Living God. So, here's an actual Pathfinder Society adventure that deals with Rasmiran. I recommend checking that out. And of course, the Lost Roman World Guide from second edition does talk about Rasmiran too. So it deals with the more current and up-to-date Rasmiran, but there hasn't been a lot of changes. Some, but not a lot. Overall. So Rasmiran is a country from its capital, Throne Step, ruled over by Rasmir. Rasmir is a theocratic dictator who declares himself basically a living god. It was originally part of the River Kingdom, and it was called the Archduchy of Melkat. A lot of times, the leadership would change. But in 4661, Rasmir conquered it. And he is more tyrant than actual god, but pretends to be a god. We'll separate out the church aspect of it, but we should talk a little bit about the government and rulership of Rasmir Miriam to start out. The, the actual aspects of that related to the church we'll get into a little bit later. So they are a realm dedicated to Rasmir. Um, he is their living god. He basically asserts that he achieved divinity by passing the test of the Star Stone and claims now the Rasmir on, on his own. That's a lot. Unbeknownst to many of the inhabitants of the theocracy. He's basically a powerful arcanist that has no remorse in tricking an entire population to venerating him as an all-powerful god, with the help of his chief lieutenants, uh, colloquially called the Visions. So basically, his Visions would be aware that he's not a god, but they're totally up for it because they get to rule a nation. Uh, the gold mask priests who achieve the rank of Vision of the 15th Step perform the day-to-day -day running of the country. They come from all walks of life. Some are fierce warriors, others are powerful wizards. They all dress identically, and most citizens obey them without question. Many are vicious sadists with lust for power, looking for an excuse to victimize, victimize the downtrodden. Uh, the rank of Mask of the Twelfth Step, who wear silver mask, is the second highest rank in the Ramirez priesthood. Um, despite having little to do with the day, country's daily to day operations, Rasmir's basically proclamations, even though they tend to be very erratic, are always in force. Um, Brasmir issues these commands from 31-stepped throne, 
and each step supposedly representing one of the stage of Razmir went through to achieve divinity. Atop this throne, he hides his aging from behind an ornate ivory mask and grows more power-hungry every year. Older, too. Older and more power-hungry. So, Asmirin has terrible relationships with all of its neighbors. Ustlav to the north, Kionin, the elven haven, to the south, and to the east, the River Kingdom, which Rasmirin once belonged. It has poor relations with nearby Brevery, who detest their priests due to their reputation of spreading dissonant wherever they go. Um, the River Kingdom of Lambreth lies very close to the theocracy. Its proximity has uh, brought about a particular violent history between the two nations, as Ramiran seeks to expand its land influence into the River Kingdoms through conversion. Rasmirin regardless of this, has a number of temple embassies in several of the River Kingdoms. It has also launched raids into Kionin in order to attempt to punish uh, perceived elven heresy and is a constant thorn in the elves' side. The faith of Razmir is illegal in Usulav soon after the nation was founded. And despite later claiming hundreds of acres in the land south of Varno, Razmir Riri missionaries became the victims of numerous unexplained disappearances among their numbers. The discovery of bloodless corpses soon followed after, deterring future immigration, and it made Razmiri understandably nervous of his northern nation. It's probably related to the vampires that totally get along with Ustalov's government that are there, that totally don't want the Whispering Tyrant in charge, and want Ustalov to remain a number of things. On the other hand, now, there is a new problem for Razmir and his country. The Whispering Tyrant, Tarbafon! Last Wall had kept an eye on Razmir and his clergy before its fall. They didn't want their cities distracted by uh, missionaries uh, from there with their watch of the whole of in and the prison of the Whispering Tyrant. After the Whispering Tyrant froze him, uh, freed himself, gained some power back in 4719, Razmir approached him with an offer. He wouldn't interfere with the Lich's plan as long as the Living God's efforts and nation were left in peace. The bargain was seemingly struck in honor, but there have been hints that it was purchased by Razmir at a high price. Uh, rumors have surfaced that Razmir supplied the forces of the Gravelands with bodies of the Razmiri dead to serve in Parvathon's armies in exchange for neutrality. Um, Razmiri people have strong taboos concerning the handling of the dead, who are seldom viewed uh, before they are given to public mausoleums. So it's not surprising this wasn't confirmed. Also, a lot of the dead are said to come from the massive prison mines known as the Forgotten Trap where the condemned have disappeared for decades. So with all this, the members of the clergy have noticed that Razmir is becoming even more erratic and is withdrawn. The Whispering Tyrant is a threat to the region, and he's worried that his deal isn't going to be, you know, protected. And, you know, his followers worry about this behavior. We're worried that this could affect the living god's ability to protect them. He is a living god, technically. There's uh, the Mask of Razmir. Let's talk about the history of the what was the, uh, the Archduchy of Melkat as now remains it. We'll start with the Archduchy. Just a little bit. I'm going to blow my mute and blow my nose. I'm a little sick. So the Archduchy is a place that even throughout its history its long history, just kept changing rulers. It was a lot like many of the other river kingdoms. Basically, Razmir came in, using his supposed uh, divine powers, overthrew the local magistrate, uh, the trade, trade uh, guilds of the city of Zare, gathered his followers by coercion and guile. Um, 
Eventually, only the ruler, Duke Melcat, resisted him from the capital of Erdwin in the Virgin Forest. He arrived on the 17th of Erastus and demanded three times that the Duke swear fealty to him, rebuked, rebuked three times. That night, he summoned a cloud of fire and engulfed the city, killing all its inhabitants and reducing the structure to ashes. On that night, Rasmirin was born. So, violence is its history. But, yeah. And, uh, since then, it has expanded its borders on five separate occasions, each time at the expense of the neighboring river kingdoms or the country of Ustalav. Uh, Kionin and Evelyn. They tried. But, yeah. It's a violent history. Let's talk about the geographical features there. And we'll talk about the cities that are there. So it is on the shores of Lake Incarthur. It's the westernmost of what was formerly a river, river kingdoms would have touched. It's not a large country compared to many of the great nations that inner sea, like Andron and Taldor. It is a huge country, though, compared to the numerous tiny river kingdoms to the east. Considering it began as a river kingdom, and with over 60 years of existence gaining size, it is a considerable gain, and its conquests are pretty impressive. Its biggest feature is the exalted woods at the center of the country. Um, a secret fortress devoted to the worship of Razmir lies at the center of the wood, giving the place a fell reputation. The Glass River is the most notable of the rivers, which runs through it before emptying into Lake Incarth. Uh, Avalon Bay is also there. It borders between Ustalav and them. Uh, Caliphas is on the large bay there. I've talked about Lake Incarth in the past, so if you want to look into that, I'd recommend checking out some of my older videos. The Exalted Woods were on Varigan Woods Forest. So Varigan Forest, the forest in which Razmir burned down the old capital is the Exalted Woods. Great place to, like, call it there. Just saying. Uh, the tracks is already uh, also an area within his things. Um, it's a area of jagged cliffs, canyons, uh, north of the city of Thronestep, the capital. The region looks like the earth is decaying to resemble a set of tracks, hence its name. A particular deep canyon here is the Forgotten Track, which is where the secret prison he has for those who have lost faith or displeased Razmir. Uh, yeah. The West Salem River touch, touch, touches it. Let's talk about the cities that are within Razmir. There are five cities we know the name of. We know Prophet's Rest, but we don't know a lot about it. The other four, which we know a little bit about uh, from information provided in various books, uh, Pilgrimage is a small, a small growing port town on the northern shore of Lake Incarthen. Um, it began as a roadside tavern on the road between Zara on the Glass River and the new capital of Thrones, uh, Throne step farther up the coast, and kind of has grown there since then. It's the main town for doing, doing business out of sight of the Church of Rasmi, or at least without direct inter interference. Most business is still conducted with their knowledge, um, so they still have approval there, but they don't get to see anything. Of course, uh, Whisper Truth. The small settlement uh, located in the Virgin Forest of Razmir. And it's a settlement of runaways. So they keep secret from the government. So Whisper Truth is a place where people that are failed priests, criminals, iconoclasts, or those who have fled the government and the church are going to be left alone. Um, the town has never been raided by government, but not because Razmir doesn't know where it is. Um, basically, he learned about it with divination long ago, and he's been scrying on its leaders, and he plans to use the town as a scapegoat for further atrocities, and currently doesn't have a need to expose Whisper Truth. 
but Razmir knows it's there. Sucks to be them. Of course, Zare is an important port on the banks of Lake Encarthen and the Glass River. It's two, one of the two main ports in all of Razmirin, and a lot of trade goods that flow across the lake are funneled through Zare. It's tightly controlled by the priests of Razmir, who collect tithes from every business there. Uh, and since everyone in Zare must be worship of Razmir, they collect from everyone. If you visit the city, the priests aren't fussy about demanding tithes from you and indoctrinating foreign sailors and merchants with the tenets of Razmir's religion until they agree to willingly donate to them. And the sort of behavior is not just limited to those that walk down the streets. Faith barges, piloted there by their masked priests, sail in the waters around, boarding ships, even those that are not making port to Zare nearby to spread the faith and collect tithes for those that pass. So don't get too close to Zare. And it was the first city conquered by Razmir in the conquered region. And then, of course, his new capital, the large city of Thronestead, which is a port city on the banks of Lake and Carthen. It is the capital of Razmir. It's the newest settlement in Avastia. It's among the newest ones. And it basically, having been built 50 years ago. So it's a very new settlement for a large city. It was built by a small army of later laborers in a short time, in 4672, and it's designed to be the capital and home of the living God. It's a paradise for the faithful, that are constructed of fine woods and imported stones. There's depictions of Razmir's uh, masked visage looking down at everyone. There are, because of the policies and attitudes of the church, the city became divided into two delineated districts, the steps and stones. The steps of the smaller of the two districts is home to Razmir's elite. It's a place of debauchery and de decadence, home to the visions and high-ranking officers of the church. The stones is much larger than the steps, and it's the slum that housed the majority of the nation's poor. It's filled with those stricken with poverty and disease who dwell in ramshackle havas, living in hopes of gaining an audience uh, with their god through the choosing. A weekly ritual and five worshippers are selected to speak and plead their case with Razmir himself. Um... This ritual is as fake as Razmir's divinity, though. Um, and those that are chosen are plants put there by the church. So they leave the city in false hope. That's Throne Step for you. Later, Worm. Enjoy lunch. Razmir has some of the largest stretches of arable, land, uh, arable lands in the region it's in besides some of the, one of the areas of Brever. It's found in small pockets along the Selen River and tightly controlled by the government. And it's one of the main reasons why there's little open rebellion against the dictatorial regime. It produces enough foodstuffs to export them to neighboring countries. It exports cloth, lumber, fine woodworks, and alchemical, herbal, and medical supplies. So as much as it's a kind of annoying thorn in a lot of people's sides, it does do some things that makes it very important. So, peasants are the main inhabitants of Razmirin. You go figure with that one. And they live like, uh... Basically, they're a poor that slave under any other tyrant's harsh rule. The only difference between other tyrants is those that speak ill of Razmir are not executed, but instead burned as heretics and heathens. So you're just not executed as traitor, you're burned as a heretic or heathen. Religion is a large role in the daily life than, than most other states. It's the state's tool of control. If you worship any uh, worshiping any god other than Razmir is banned, and few dare attempt the wrath uh, of his faithful by criticizing this policy. The inadequacy, inadequacy between the peasants and the ruling class is extreme. The poor are taxed to near starvation while the clergy live in luxury. The people take some solace in the fact that they're protected from outside threats by Razmir, which are oftentimes reminded of. So there's little organized opposition against the regime, and that exists in the exalted woods, um, in the crossroad towns of pilgrims, while rebels are um, dream of breaking the living god's stranglehold of the nations. A small colony of Shacklebar and Cambians live in Razmir, trained from youth to serve the will of the clergy. Um, 
is to believe that these are the offspring of Velstrak torturers employed to persuade doubtful acolytes. However, the priests have never conserved dealing with evil outsiders. Let's talk the Church of Razmir, as we see clergy here, because that's what we have to finish up today on. Because the if we're talking about Razmir, and we have to talk about Razmir and his church. You know? So, yeah. The church is a cult that surrounds its self proclaimed god, Rasmus. That's the best way to describe it. Members enforce proclamations over theocracy and just outlaw everything else. It's what they do. The priests have oversight of every part of society, acting as enforcers more than spiritual guides. The poorest laborers must tilt the portion of the meager income to the priesthood, the tithing step. Everyone is forced to pay exorbitant taxes, and the priests live in luxury and comfort. Many Razmiran's people aspire to join the priesthood. Regardless of their religious beliefs or their doubts about the divinity, it's the path out of poverty. Hundreds of doubters are sent to the heart of exiled woods, uh, exalted woods, indoctrinated into the faith. Those returned come back changed. Uh, they seem to lose all uh, doubts and return with a newfound faith. And many explain with unexplained burns and scars, though ne uh, some never return at all. Foul rituals are said to take place there. Whoops, minds and souls. And because Razmir is not a true god, his priests cannot cast true divine spells. They use arcane magic masks the deficiency. Healing, which is normally staple of all clerics, is a problem for Razmiran priests. They use obscure arcane magic, folk remedies, and holy artifacts to cure. So-called holy artifacts. The priests are quite convincing, and able to dupe most commoners uh, that they are perform magic. They still perform magic, nonetheless. So, yeah. The hierarchy. Let's talk about that a little bit. The faithful are strictly ordered by the loyalty of Razmir and what they've done to accomplish in his name. The orders refer to the steps and correspond to the number of steps one is allowed to climb in a temple to approach the mask symbol of the living god. Each one is given a rogue and a mask that this, uh, that a rogue and a robe and a mask that determine, denounce their step. Acolytes of the first step wear a white robe and iron mask. Priests of the third step, gray robe and iron mask. Herald of the eighth step, black robe and iron mask. Mask of the twelfth step, blue robe and silver mask. Uh, visions of the fifteenth step, red robe and gold mask. They generally achieve promotion not through acts of faith, but by seizure of new territory and worshippers of Razmi. When trying to expand the faith into new uh, regions, temples are always built in the poorest neighborhoods first. The clergy began working for the poor, sick, handing out alms to attract followers. Clergy then used glowing flocks of faithful to help influence the government while extorting money from local businesses to protect them from their mobs. Once you nurture for suffice of clout, it begins to install members of the faith in the local position of power. So they're very infiltrated when they take over. The faith is a relatively simple one. It preaches about a life of acquisition of golden power. Those who follow teachings of the living God, God may enjoy life's luxuries, while blasphemers and heretics deserve only to toil for the faithful. The faith preaches its superiority to all other faiths, other gods being regarded as lesser and irrelevant. The outsiders need to be converted by force, if necessary, to the fold. Many of the tenets and rules of the clergy tend to be vague and open to interpretation. Punishment also varies depending on the whim of the superior priest at the time. Many rules are intentionally contra uh, contradictory to allow more experienced clerics to punish acolytes and they therefore imbue fear and obedience into offending individuals. 
the bodies of the dead are considered unclean and taboo, and recently the deceased are generally taken to be disposed of in communal mausoleums. Temples. A temple is located in every village of Imrazmir, in, in every market square. And they've spread into several river kingdoms. Mothun, Mithras, Ustla, as much as they could. The governments of Druma, Kion, and Elaspal have banned their worship and forbade the clergy from proselytizing. Most churches are simple. The large central worship chamber rounds a set of steps that leads to a gold or silver mask. The steps represent 31 steps Frasmir took uh, for the step of stars, test of Star Stone. They're frequently found uh, throughout the liturgy of the church and found literally in the buildings. So. But that's the church of Razmir. Which is very important to Razmir. And that's Razmir as a whole. It's a forced cult. Of a lot of people that honestly, plenty of people in positions of power know it's a cult. It's this weird thing that, certainly, everybody acts as though Razmir is a living god, and talk as if Razmir is a living god, but you get the feeling that everybody's in on the fact that he's not a living god. I mean, the masses are forced to worship him as he is of that. And they maybe they believe something. They're given hope to believe, but certainly there's a lot of evidence to believe that they are also horribly abused. And what you know, whether or not you believe or not, doesn't matter. Getting into the priesthood is the way to get better in life. Get steps out of that. And the priests, none of them get divine spells. Certainly the ones at the top know he's not a living god. But you have to think, all the priests under him who are mostly, you know, using magic items that heal uh, medicine, or honestly speaking, arcane magic, gotta know something's up. It's this weird joke of it, but it's also this abusive cult that follows a dictator who conquered a nation and said a lie. And pretend to be a god. Rasmiran's an interesting country. It's a dangerous place to be. But certainly a place for adventure. Possibly. Or perhaps. Influence of Rasmiran can cause. Adventure. Hard to say. Both to be true. It's definitely a nation. That has seen its fair shares of up and downs and will continue to exist and maybe even grow. Its influence and conquest in parts of the River Kingdoms could expand. Certainly Ustla is keeping it at bay. Kyonin is. A lot of nations have outlawed it. And it's worship. But it's through its worship that it conquests. It doesn't require massive armies. Not always. It just requires sending some people in and convincing you it's a great idea to worship our living God. He's a living God. You too can join us. You can have better lives. And then slowly but surely put people in places of the power. And then replace the power structures. And then you're as good as another part of the nation. Welcome to the fold. Infiltration. Conversion. That's right. And that's me. But what will happen? He's so retired. Razmir's age. He still seeks immortality. He hasn't found it yet. There's a lot of questions about what's going on. Razmir will even turn towards that witch. There's something really dark if he goes desperate. Could be a storyline. A living god. Lich god. Do we had Vecna? Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. We dove into an interesting country. And kind of 
dark and twisted country, but an interesting one nonetheless. A cult country. Remember, check me out on both YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch if you haven't already. I said all the things for those. Uh, if you've played around and uh, either had an adventure in Razmirin or related to the church or Razmir itself, let me know. That's the, that's the question for today. Um, again, and hey, uh, if you want to check me social media, Discord, Twitter, I've got the link below. Uh, and uh, if you want to check things out live on Twitch, the schedule is Tuesdays, Thursdays, usually in the afternoon between 1 or 2, give or take, depending on life schedule. Thursdays is the Pathfinder day where I go over Pathfinder lore stuff. Then Saturdays around 11 o'clock in the morning, pretty exact on that. I have Wednesdays at 9 p.m. EST, Eastern Standard Time, a Pathfinder first edition live play, Crimson Queen, check it out, it's really fun. We deal with a lot of that lore stuff sometimes I talk about, but it's a actual Pathfinder game. It was a lot of fun, really great adventure, really fun time. And then discussing tabletops every Saturday at 6 p.m. EST. We talk about news of the week, some deeper discussion topics. You can catch us live. We'll give you those up on YouTube. All right. I'm going to get going now. I'm going to say farewell, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. I hope you enjoyed diving into all this. And until the next time we talk about Pathfinder, tabletop, or whatever else is out there, and visit maybe more nations that are very interesting to you here, or other stuff. I bid all of you out there, farewell.